With that, I would like to close the public hearing on Senate Bill 785 and open a public hearing on Senate Bill 744, Rico Dents. Madam Chair, members of the committee, Senate, board, Senate Bill 44, uh, 744 is in front of you. It provides the Oregon Health Authority with rulemaking authority to develop and disseminate information to providers and patients, educating them about bone marrow donations and how to register with the National Bone Marrow Registry. I mean, speak. Well, thank you, Senator, for introducing the bill. I appreciate that Oregon is the very first state to introduce this bill. Um, I've been traveling the U.S. and advocating. You for need to say your name first. Oh, my name is Rico Dents, and I am started an, an organization called the Great River Rally, and I'm advocating for young adults dealing with cancer. I live with chronic myeloid leukemia, and actually I drove in from Connecticut with 75 bucks to my name and a tank of gas, and I came out here because how important this is. Because the bone marrow registry basically it helps people to save lives. Um, we're giving people hope. Less than 2% of Americans are registered bone marrow donors. Um, yesterday I was over at Oregon State University and there was about 100 students and it took about four hours to get 100 registered bone marrow donors. It takes time um, versus having a doctor talk about the bone marrow registry with people who from 18 to 44. What I do recommend is within the legislation to add the question on the questionnaire for the patient intake form so it saves time with the doctor and makes it more efficient so the doctor's not always thinking about um, the bone marrow registry because they need to make sure they're taking care of the patient as well. But um, there's some new advancements on technology from um, cerebral palsy, um, even um, nerve and restoring the nerve um, for perf peripheral blood stem cell trans transplant. Um, <laughs> so there's a lot of stuff in the future. We don't know how much this bone marrow registry will help save additional lives beyond that. Um, every nine minutes someone dies in the U.S. from a, bone, um, from a blood cancer and, incre and less than 50 percent ever find the match that they need and 70 percent of all the matches come from uh, non-family members and do you, do you guys know the difference of the two types of how to receive bone marrow? Okay, a lot of people, it's been since 1986, the peripheral um, blood stem cell transplant happens. Um, a lot of people still think about having to get the, the transplant from the hip bone and that fearful from it from back in the 70s because we hear about the fear, not hearing about the ease of the current 80% of all transplants happen and basically it's like as simple as giving plasma now these days so it's a lot so easier. So how do you get the uh, the match? It, do, it doesn't come from the bone? Where, where do, how do um, you do now, now basically what they in, um, inject a drug in you called fulgrasm. It increases your your blood DNA um, and then they extract it um, three to five percent of it through your vein and using a dialysis machine and then putting it back and your, the blood through the other way, the other vein. So it's a very simple procedure. It takes a couple hours for someone, um, and it really gives a person the opportunity to live. I've known two people who did not get the transplant that they needed to pass away. Um, I don't need a transplant. I, I have a different type of leukemia, but um, less than 50% of the people ever find a match that they need. Yes, a couple of questions, kind of off subject, just a little bit. I mean, I, I had, I had a bone graft in my wrist where they took marrow out of my hip. This was a long time ago, obviously, um, but I was also on the on the registry. Why do you age off of the bone marrow registry? Um, basically, the DNA isn't. Uh, I think is is good. I don't know the full answer of that, okay. but okay. I think basically between of eight, 44 and older. Um, they want healthier patients per se, even though someone who's <laughs> older. I know, I know the, the terminology, <laughs> and, okay, and, okay. and I'm not. <laughs> I mean, I, I can't donate because I have leukemia. I mean, there's. Well, and I, I mean, I signed up long, long time ago, obviously, because I had a friend with leukemia, and I thought maybe you never know. And but then I find out that. I'm, I'm too old, and I, I know I'm too old for a lot of things, but, but I, 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 it, that just, it didn't quite make sense to me as how you could age out of something like that because my bones are still working and producing stuff. So anyway. I haven't found this. I could ask about that scientific information and get back to you. Okay, okay we don't have any. Do you have any other questions for him? 
Okay. Um, I, I just do encourage you guys to really look at the bill. I didn't have ch chances to get the testimony from That's other okay. people. That's okay. This is a great introduction. Sometimes it takes two or three sessions for us to get something through the legislature. So this is a really good first step. Also, I would like you to know that uh, once I hear that you drove out from Connecticut, uh, next time, let's Skype or um, do telecommunication. Uh, we, we, I'm sure we have contacts with some people back in Connecticut that could do that. Well, I was thinking, too, I, because I've had some flack from people about what I'm doing, um, and I wanted to get the video of actually showing that I've been testifying and oh, doing okay. what I'm saying. That's so right. So this is the first date to show proof. No, um, and, and, and quite honestly, whether whether we can go there this time or not, Madam Chair, the, the fact is encouraging people to be to get on any donor registry, I think, is a, is, is a very worthwhile effort. Cause, definitely. Because I'm on every damn one I can find. So. <laughs> okay. And, and it's very simple, and I think the key is it's um, a lot of people just don't know the information how to get registered. Right. And the doctor is the easiest one because they're a medical professional to ease any potential fear or questions that someone has. Um, it's not the same thing as the DMV. I've talked to many people thinking that you get registered at the DMV versus being registered uh, of the, don the donor, you know, on your card if you're a donor. That's once you pass away. People don't even know that you could donate bone marrow when you're alive. Yeah. I mean, it's not death. And so there's a lot of misinformation out there. And because um, I think it's still the cheapest way to, to get the information through the doctor, it doesn't cost anything to the doctor, it doesn't cost anything to the patient, it doesn't cost anything to the state. Um, and it's a win-win-win bill. Um, so you. you help to save lives. And, and um, hopefully you'll be able to um, access this hearing video. Yeah. Yes, you know how to do that. Okay. Now stay <laughs> right you. there, but I will close the public hearing on uh, Senate Bill 744 and open a public hearing on Senate Bill 859. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, Senate Bill 859, the measure would require licensed physicians that practice oncology in Oregon to discuss fertility risks with adoles adolescent oncology patients. Requires the Oregon Medical Board to adopt rules and implement provisions of the bill. There is a dash one post on all this, no impact statements. Well, um, thank you. Uh, my name is Rico Dentz. Do I repeat? Yes. Okay, my name is Rico Dentz, and I started the Great Ribbon Rally, and um, I've been to 20 states in the last um, since June, and I've met with a lot of young adults dealing with cancer, um, and a lot of them have talked to me. Probably 90, 95 percent of them said that the doctor didn't talk to them, the oncologist talked to them about um, fertility prior to cancer treatment, um, and this is an important issue. Um, according to Stupid Cancer, 13 percent, only 13 percent of oncologists do talk about fertility options. Um, I've also seen the National Coalition of Cancer. And, and 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 CCN and they have basically the top 20 hospitals in the U.S. and they do talk about the importance of fertility and discussion on it. Um, but in other statistics, less than 50 percent of educational facilities ever talk about fertility options, and non-educational hospitals, it's less than 10 percent. So I mean, there there's a lot of questions across the board on what it is, but the problem is is that once you're diagnosed with cancer and you get some chemotherapy, it could cause you to become infertile. Um, women never grow new eggs. Um, they get the eggs um, in the ovaries right away. Um, and then adult males, you know, that's a whole different thing. But preserving fertility is a very important issue. Um, and why that's important is we've gotten now people who are surviving longer don't necessarily think about once you're diagnosed with cancer, you're not thinking about fertility. You're thinking about, am I going to live? What do I need to do to live? And you're now look, learning either chemotherapy or other regimens <coughs> that are going on. And I was over at Yale Hospital in February, and I was at the Young Adult Smilo. Um, it's called Impact Group. There were six of us, there was six other people, and, and I was the only guy there. And, and we were just talking about this issue. And in Yale, which is one of the top hospitals in the world, um, 
all of them didn't feel like there were adequately discussed fertility options um, prior to their treatment, and they learned stuff afterwards. I was down in Houston um, with a friend of mine. I met him and talking. He had stomach cancer, and pr just that day prior to cancer, tr his oncology treatment, he asked the nurse, "Is this going to cause me to become infertile?" And he was like, uh, "The nurse was like, yeah, no one talked to you about it." Um, so this is an issue because ha being able to have a kid in your arm is the most important thing. I mean, after being diagnosed with cancer and dealing with that and dealing with those emotions, then being told now you can't have kids because you were not discussed fertility options and you not preserved your fertility. And I've heard stories and pun stories of people who I've talked to about that. And, um, it's just sad because I was living with cancer and I couldn't imagine because I could have kids in the future, but I couldn't imagine after just dealing with what you've had to deal with, deal with the financial challenges, deal with the emotional challenges of, of friends and, and other issues. And then finding out, you finally find a spouse or a husband and you got to tell them that I can't have kids. And that's a tough situation. So. Let's help prevent the double whammy. Yeah. So, so you're saying that, I mean, it is possible then to um, freeze your sperm or freeze yes. the eggs uh, ahead of time, and you're, you're saying that this is not uh, a routine practice among physicians. Yes, um, and even in the non-educational facilities, even with testicular cancer, patients, 10% um, of the doctors talk about preserving fertility. Well, the representative from the Cancer Society is in the back room, and, yes. and uh, I'm sure he's taking notes um, to share that, to see what kind of education that we can disseminate. Uh, stay there, but we need Trevor Belts to come up from the uh, Oregon Medical Association. Good afternoon, Chair Monis Anderson, uh, Vice Chair Cruz, members of the committee. Um, my name, for the record, is Trevor Belts. I'm the Associate Director of Government Relations for the Oregon Medical Association. Uh, I want to thank you for the opportunity to testify on Senate Bill 859 today, which would requ require oncologists to discuss fertility and adolescent patients. Sorry, to discuss fertility with adolescent patients before they undergo necessary chemotherapy, radiation, and other treatment that could pose risk to a patient's fertility. The OMA and its members understand firsthand how difficult uh, it is for a patient and family to go through diagnosis and treatment for any type of cancer. Um, circumstances of an adolescent with cancer are very emotional for all involved and rightfully made more difficult given the fact that treatment may negatively impact a patient's fertility. Um, with that, however, uh, the OMA has some serious concerns with the bill before you today, uh, concerns shared by our partners at OHSU, um, and I'd like to outline several points that I've discussed with OMA's oncologist members um, on the issue. It's our understanding that the standards of practice um, already exist to discuss fertility issues with new adolescent patient uh, cancer patients. I cannot speak to other states. I cannot speak to the, the number of uh, the prevalence of that, but the oncologists that we were able to speak with uh, thought that this was a standard of practice, at least in Oregon. Um, it is important to understand that there are many components to this discussion. For example, especially in adolescent cases, time is the enemy and many diagnoses require um, urgency in the treatment plan. The other component of this very sensitive and difficult issue uh, that is not addressed in this bill um, and provides even more of an issue for these young patients is the cost to preserve um, fertility options like sperm or egg preservation. These procedures are often out of the question uh, financially for the patients and their families and are rarely covered by insurance plans. Um, so in conclusion, we think um, this legislation, although brought forward with very good intentions, um, is an unneeded bill and we do not believe that having prescriptive language in how physicians treat their patients should be placed in statute. Thank you. Um, I would hope though that if someone is diagnosed, I mean sure it's one thing when they're diagnosed when they're two or three years old, um, but if they are adolescents, I would hope that every uh, physician 
would um, discuss this with the patient, and I don't know if that's standard practice or not. It's not. So uh, I would hope that you would share this um, hearing with your members and, well, with the oncologists in particular, to see if there could be some kind of um, standard of care for adolescents. I, I haven't worked much with cancer patients, so I can't relate to the situation, but I know if I was diagnosed, I certainly would you know when you're diagnosed you, you you're going to beat this you're going to you're going to fight it and you want to go on and live a normal life and i would hope that that opportunity would be given to that patient if in particular that they would want to have um, a family in the future yeah senator Cruz. i'm wondering why it would be limited to teenagers and not include young adults section two actually oh, addresses does. that part section two which is um oncology and young adults so it is actually um cancer patients on section two we were talking about that yesterday yeah um that would be the uh, oh. parental decision also also when they're that yeah, I apologize for coming in late. I was actually out being a doctor. Um, uh, uh, so obviously, I think it's super important um, to make sure that people understand about long-term options for fertility at every age, regardless. I mean, we deal with this, obviously, with people with other chronic illnesses. We need to talk with them about fertility issues and safe plans for the future. But I guess the, the concern I have is that I worry when the state gets in the business of mandating what goes on between doctors and patients. And in general, we try really hard to stay out of the exam room. And as a physician, I'm glad of that. Can you think of some alternative ways we could approach this that would accomplish the goal of substantially increasing, not mandating, but substantially increasing the likelihood that this problem would be addressed? Without the, putting it in statute? Yeah, no, good question. The The problem is is that I, I've thought about it and I thought either prior to treatment even having the social worker talk to him about it or having another um, person because I've talked to social workers across the U.S. Mm -hmm. and they say that the, do the doctors are not adequately giving the fer fertility discussion. There is a lot of stuff that happens also at the moment when one, as you, I don't know if you've ever diagnosed someone with the cancer. I have. Um, so I don't like it. The, yeah, it's not an easy discussion. So, and that's why it's important to have like with the sign off and saying, hey, this is something to consider off and on your fertility. What the, what he didn't mention too, there was two things. He didn't give any statistics on how often the doctors were talked about um, fertility options. Second, um, federal mandate actually requires um, insurance to c cover some of the fertility stuff. Sure. But there is a two-step process. You have to get um, denied from the insurance and go to the, the board, um, the health board in Oregon. And that's an, across every single state. Um, and this is some of the stuff that we're working on getting more knowledge um alice i uh, can't think of from her, the organization who test who testified um in writing about this particular issue as well um and they met, and she met, she told me because she called me and told me that these are the different issues and how to address even the cost of fertility and preservation a lot of people don't know about it and uh -huh. it's just taking time to learn yeah and, and and even timing i understand the timing there's certain cases and is it right certain leukemias if you don't get and certain other cancers if you're not treated right then and there right you're going to die <clears throat> um so there's not the ability to have preservation and i and i know we have to work on allowing the health board to make some rules and regulations on that um and allow the doctor to make the decision, hey, in my opinion, there's no way we could do fertility because it takes three weeks, or I think it's four weeks for, for women. Um, men, it's a lot easier timing to do stuff. So, Madam Chair, if yes. I may, I, I am entirely sympathetic to what you're trying to accomplish here, and I absolutely want to make sure that our younger cancer survivors um, have every option opportunity to live a normal life, including becoming biological parents, should they so choose. As I said, I would love to be able to have you guys be thinking creatively about ways to work closely with the oncology community. I mean, for example, um, 
I know that Dr. Drucker, who's the head of the Knight Cancer Institute, is very interested in making sure that we deal really well with cancers in, in younger people and young adults, and I know that he's looking at ways of improve, you know, taking a much more holistic approach to it. So is there an opportunity for you to work with the Knight Cancer Institute? Is there an opportunity with Cancer Center at Providence and some of the other bigger cancer centers statewide? Most younger people are being treated either at Legacy or, or at Dornbacher um, because they have the pediatric expertise that a lot of other places don't have. Um, so really sympathetic and I just don't know what other steps you've tried so far to work with the oncology community directly about this mm -hmm. issue besides the, so talking to social uh, workers. Uh, Senator Hayward, as working with oncology, uh, there's a lot of red tape and, and time and effort to go through on that side. Second, what we don't always think about, we might be thinking about who's one doctor, but majority of the time, like even the older oncology like not in educational facilities, because non-educational facilities, talking about fertility is very low. It's less than 15, it's less than 13%. And so within that, the problem is too, is when a doctor doesn't typically have a young adult about colon cancer or other cancers, they're not thinking about fertility. And that's part of the issue is because they've not thought about the fertility in the non-educational facilities, and even at educational facilities. Um, and it is making the importance of saying, hey, we need to talk about this. And how much effort we're trying to try go to every single s hospital to go and do this, because that's really, at the end of the day, it has to make every single hospital to talk about it. And, and within that time frame, there's young adults who are not being able to preserve fertility options. I would like to read into the record uh, Alice Christie's, she's a nine year breast uh, mm -hmm. cancer survivor and she was able to fulfill her, her dream of having a child because she, and this is in her sta statement, I discussed fertility risk with my oncologist prior to receiving cancer treatment and then was referred to an oncofertility specialist in time to do something about it. So she also went on uh, to say that, that really our few patients are afforded this opportunity because cancer centers have really failed to implement an informed consent procedure mm -hmm. that ensures the, the fertility risk conversation. A recent article published in Cancer quoted a study in which only 13 percent of reproductive age breast cancer patients were informed of their of, that their fertility would be at risk from the life-saving cancer treatment and so you know I think this is the start of a really very important conversation and I so thank you for bringing for bringing it forward any other questions no thank you thank you so much for coming it was a delight to meet you and I wish you the best of luck thank you so much okay with that I will close the public hearing on Senate bill uh, 859 and I would like to open